You're listening to The Recovered Life Show, the show that helps people in recovery live their best recovered lives. And here is your host, Damon Frank. And welcome back to The Recovered Life Show. I'm excited to introduce our guest, Kyle Miller. Kyle is a licensed clinical professional counselor and certified clinical trauma professional. And he's here to talk with us about how to ask for help. How you doing, Kyle? I'm doing well, Damon. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, excited about this topic. I, you know, I think I mentioned before we went on the air here that I hate asking for help. I just despise it. I know I'm not the only person that's in recovery that does it. Not only getting sober did I hate asking for help, but just in life in general, I've always looked at it as a character defect. I've learned in recovery, Kyle, it's mm -hmm. not, it's essential. It's part of emotional sobriety is to understand when you need help. So thanks so much for coming on the show today uh, and talking with us and you being a licensed clinical professional counselor, you kind of bring another uh, a perspective to this. I have to ask you right up, right up front, Kyle, why do people hate this? I, I know I'm not the only one. Why do people just really hate asking for help? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and and what I would say is that I think in my experience and and working with uh, you know a lot of people that everyone's a little bit different, right? Um, but you know, it's one of the things that comes up often is uh, when I get curious about people asking for help, if if it's a, an issue for them, is talking about um, you know how were you how were you raised? Uh, Esther Perel is a, is a, a kind of a big talking head in the mental health uh, field right now, and she talks about uh, a lot of us when we're uh, when we're children, it's autonomy or um, loyalty. And so we ask people often, were you raised to be autonomous? Were you raised to be an independent person? Or were you raised to be loyal in your family? And uh, so that's a question that I ask a lot of my clients that I work with. And a lot of times people say that they were, they were raised to be loyal to their families, which also makes it, I am supposed to give. I am supposed to help you. I am supposed to make sure that all of my effort goes external, right? Uh, but if you're raised for autonomy, that actually puts unrealistic expectations on yourself and beliefs that I should be able to do everything on my own. So either way, you're actually kind of caught in a, a catch-22 situation. Yeah, I've never really thought about it like that. Kyle, but you're right. Like I know for myself, I was raised in a very Western, uh, you know, ranch setting mm. and being independent and being able to stand on your own two feet and do things for yourself was considered good, right? It was considered. And if you had to ask for help, I remember very early on, there were certain things you asked for help with, but other things, it was just like, why can't you do that yourself? You have to figure it out. And I think for people in recovery, I think might have also a lot, we know a lot of people come from alcoholic households who were also raised like this, this pattern that you're talking about, right? Yeah. And in sobriety, we're trying to figure out how do we still have independence, which is, I, I think, as a therapist, you would say is essential, right? We have to have independence in our recovery. But how do you start to open yourself up to start taking directions from other people or even asking that question, I need help? Mm hmm. That's a huge question. And I think it's like you open Pandora's box there. Um, because asking for help requires you to be uh, humble, it requires you to be vulnerable. Um, and it requires safety. So or, I mean, or you kind of pushing past not feeling those things to ask for help, which is a really hard thing to do. Uh, and so I think it's a really key relational skill because in relationship with other people, we it's important that there's a give and take. It's important that if I'm in a relationship with you, that 
you feel like you're contributing to the relationship. And it's important that I feel like I am also contributing to the relationship. And yet in our society, I think our society mirrors what you've talked about is that independence and not asking for help and doing it on your own. And we see asking for help as a sign of weakness. That means that you're not capable, right? Yeah. But absolutely. I love that. As we know, like any type of like being, uh, maintaining sobriety requires other people in your life. It's it, it, the independence puts so much uh, pressure on you as an individual, and it's unrealistic to to think in my mind. And I get, I could be wrong. There might be outliers out there, but we as humans are relational. We're we're made to be in relation with others, and so if we don't learn how to ask for help, I think oftentimes loneliness. And um, and separation from others is partially what creates the issue to begin with. And then we we need to self-medicate because you can't feel that all the time. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things I was going to ask you that you that you brought up here early on was how I have noticed, even though it was very difficult for me to ask for help. I was more than willing to give help to other buddy and and I would actively seek it. I would volunteer, I would even if I wasn't asked I would help, right? And I've yeah. seen this in recovery and I don't want to call it codependency, but it kind of borders on that. I found that a lot of people in recovery uh because of either the way that they're raised or what they've learned, right? Or the opposite as far as giving help, but are the worst about putting on their own oxygen mask when the plane is going down, right? Yeah. And yeah. I found that not being able to actually say, hey, I'm struggling. Can you give me some advice? Hey, you know, I'm really kind of stuck in this area of my life. Can you tell me, can you give me some advice? Because I've seen that you've been through this before. The inability to be able to get there really, I think, keeps people trapped in recovery. I call it church basement thinking. They're just trapped, right? Because when, mm -hmm. even though I hated it, Kyle, at, at the most part, I had an epiphany one day. I said to myself, you know what, Damon? Anything, I, my thinking got me here. My thinking's not necessarily going to get me out of this. So all everything that I'm going to get really as far as new thinking is going to come from other people. So I need to really shift my perspective and really start asking and interacting with other people and be willing, even if I don't know how, at least I could be willing to start taking some suggestions, not only what suggestions, but also really hearing what people have to say, a different perspective on the situation. Because the only way I'm really going to get out of the situation that I'm in. Yeah, absolutely. And that is, um, that's been mirrored uh, in a lot of the, the work that I've done personally. And a lot of the work that I, a lot of my clients do um, is we kind of hold, we're holding people at arm's length and, I think naturally uh, for people who grew up uh, believing that independence is the key, we're skeptical of other people and their advice, right? And so I think what we need to do is the relational piece of it is learning how to trust that other people have our best interests at heart, right? And I I have seen and I have uh, experienced that relational radar can be malfunctioning. And so you go into a room and you can't really discern who who is for me and who isn't, right? And so I'm keeping that guy at arm's length. I'm keeping that guy at arm's length and or that person at arm's length. And you end up, again, feeling alone and all of the pressure remains on you. And that is, again, an unrealistic expectation of yourself. Uh, but if that is how you see things like, you know, watching Clint Eastwood and his movies, like that guy could do anything, right? Like <laughs> he's just the strong guy and can maintain anything. And, you know, um, and, and there's no faults, right? 
How do you how do you start? You know, one of the things that you're talking about is just, you know, starting to interact and creating relationships. We talk about this a lot on the Recovered Life show about how to create relationships in recovery, not just romantic relationships, but really personal relationships, how to reset the relationships in your family, right? Those kind of relate because that's really what life is all about. That's where all the joy is going to come. That's where the interaction is yeah. going to come, the knowledge, all this stuff. But so many people that are in recovery, Kyle, and I know I was one of them, had some trauma that was in their childhood, right? And it had to do with, with, with alcoholism. It had to do with, you know, other things that created trauma. I didn't know this until, you know, 20 years into my 30 year journey that that was actually called trauma. You know, I just, I was not right. aware of it. I knew that it affected me, but you know, part of that trauma came from people, right? That it, it, it came from people that were close to me. Like, and so, I think reaching out in recovery, why it's been like a muscle, I call it a muscle, being able to reach out and connect with people in recovery has been um, has been great for me in, in my journey. And then, you know, in my career and then eventually, you know, outside of, of the rooms of like Alcoholics Anonymous and 12-step groups, you know, I was able to kind of take that to the next level and create relationships all over the place. But one of the... One of the stumbling blocks, I think, was picking the right kind of people because I found that if you had trauma in your past or maybe you just didn't have good models about how to do that, sometimes the picker gene of who I would pick to ask for the help was the worst. There might be 10 people. I would pick the worst person, right? Mm -hmm. Costly. And I see this in recovery over and over and over. How do you start to, to, to kind of judge who the people in your life that are safe to actually ask for help because there are people that aren't safe to yeah. ask for help. You know, they're actually going to yeah. put you in a worse place. Yeah. Well, I'd be interested to hear your perspective on this, but my belief is that it starts with you. So it really is kind of looking at that inner work. Like, where did this come from? Why do I, why is this picker? Well, you called it a picker gene. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that I called it the radar, right? Like your, yeah. your radar for who's safe and who's not, uh, or who's good for me and who's not, that is, is faulty because of, you know, it could be, a, a big T or little T trauma, right? It could be something that, that really bad has happened, or it could be, um, you know, little T traumas are these, it, it could be just someone picking at you or being, um, critical of you over time. Like those things I think are actually more insidious than what we consider traumas in our lives. Uh, it's those like having someone bully you in school or just um, having a parent, uh, you know, make fun of you for crying or, you know, things like those kinds of things. We think they're not a big deal, but that's what formulates how you believe about yourself and you carry that into adulthood. So one of my beliefs, and it's, you know, it's metaphorical, is that, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Terry Real. He's a, a, he created relational life therapy, and he talks about the wounded child, the adaptive child, and then the wise adult. Um, your wise adult is the one that we're sitting here right now having an intellectual conversation, a theoretical conversation, and a real conversation. And then you've got an adaptive child that is still inside of you that pops up when you get triggered or when you are you know, feeling hurt or you want revenge on someone or you're having a hard time forgiving or you are, uh, you know, trying to be overly independent that is a that's an you know an adaptive response to some of the things that may have happened in your life and then the wounded child is the one that's like carrying all the pain that's like when you're in your fight or flight mode um and that i really believe that that is what's coming up and so if you do your inner work and realize oh my gosh that was just like hurt me that came up and is like, I don't trust this person because the hurt part of me just popped up. We need to have some self-compassion. And I know that that one, a term, a lot of people don't like it because it's a buzzword and it sounds kind of hokey, but actually what we're doing is we're giving a little bit of love to that kid who was hurt 
and had to adapt to situations and created a way of being that was protective. The other thing is those are well-earned defense mechanisms, right? Because at one point you had to stay safe. So yes, I don't doubt that. Just take a step back and realize, yes, I did this in my past and I had to stay safe. Now I'm in this program and there are all these other people around me. Some of them may be safe. Some of them may not be, but I can't tell the difference right now. And if if I get triggered or if I choose that person who is who is not good for me, that's because I believe, and just using the term, your adaptive child popped up. Because th- what is it feeding in you? What pattern from your history is repeating itself? I love right? how you use the adaptive child. I love, you know, because I think I, not even knowing what that is, I definitely have, you know, I have those conversations with myself. You know, one of the one of the interesting things is, is when this pops up, oh, this person's not safe, right? There, there are boundaries and there are, I think that there are little checklists that you can have, right? Mm-hmm. I think dumping everything on somebody that you don't know and you have no experience with how they're going to handle it is just, you know, what I, you know, the whole trauma dump thing isn't really a good idea in general, right? For yes. anyone, whether they're, yeah. where, whether they're in recovery or not, just because you, the, the perspective, even of the listener, of the person receiving it, that you, you don't even know if you're really communicating it in, in a way that they're going to receive it. Right. So I, I, I love that. But this, this inner dialogue, one of the things I, ha- I had to realize about myself is when that popped up, that little inner dialogue, I had to ask myself, well, is this the third grade Damon that's looking mm-hmm. at this? And, you know, I had like a little checklist and, you know, I got that from my sponsor, you know, that yeah. I had kind of put together myself. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm not endangered. You know, uh, I, I don't have any physical danger in the, in the situation. Uh, there's nothing terrible that's going to happen here. Uh, my experience with this person has been great all along. There are no warning signs of any of these warning signs. Why am I having this this feeling? I acknowledge the feeling that I'm yeah. having it, and I don't try to make it wrong. I used to make it right. I don't I do not do that right. But mm-hmm. then I also realize, okay, well, I'm looking at this not in a correct way. This is a wrong way to look at this. That This is not really what's going on, right? And I think... So many people, there's like, what's going on in recovery? And then I always say, there's what's really going on in recovery. Right. And all of the healing is really like, what's really going on? What's really going on is fear, pride, all this other stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It's what it's always what's underneath it, right? And that's the scary stuff, though, because you have to be, you have to find the right person or people to be vulnerable with. If it's your sponsor, that's great. If it's a therapist, that's great. If it's a a really good friend, that's great too. Um, But you just have to be careful about the friend because they're, I always tell people your family and your friends are emotionally invested in your wellness. So they will jump to advice. They will jump to, you know, trying to guide you. And sometimes they're not right, you know, about what's good for you. I mean, it may be what's right for them, but I think one of the things that's hard for us to do at times is to put ourselves in uh, the other person's shoes and be like, you know, what do you, what do you think might be, might work best for you? Well, you know, this whole thing that's going on now, Kyle, about this buzzword about transactional relationships, right? I mean, every relationship is transactional to a certain degree, but one of the things I've realized is that, um, you know, being in business and having a successful business career I, I noticed that one of the things that was a huge no-no for me was kind of aligning that those personal relationships and business related, like, like I had to make sure that they weren't transactional in a way with the people that I'm really getting that devi- uh, advice about how I really feel about certain personal issues, you know, because like you're, you know, if you're in these transactional relationships where they get some sort of benefit over telling you a certain thing, right? You might not be getting the truth totally, the truth Mm. of the capital T. You know, why I'm a huge fan of 12-step groups was it was really the first time that I really got really the truth. Like, people would tell me, like, like I said, man, I've kind of, like, really blown it here. I made a really bad move. Yes, you did. 
like they just tell me, you know what I mean? They didn't sugarcoat it. They're like going, yes, you did. Like you, yeah. like that wasn't a good move. Like, and, and they were truthful. They, they were like compassionately truthful with me. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, and I think that that is so important. Can we talk about that? Like the role of a good sponsor or a therapist like yourself in this whole thing about creating, uh, starting to create trust with having these relationships and being able to open up and ask for help and get opinions from people, how important it is to have that kind of those type of people in your life. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when, when you said compassionate truth, truth, that's what really struck me is because, uh, and I've noticed this so many times, I have a tendency to be more of a direct, I'm kind of direct in the way that I do therapy. I speak, uh, I tell hard truths sometimes. Um, and people really, if a lot of people feel seen when you do that, you know, if I, if, if you say, yeah, what you did was really harmful and it was actually kind of toxic. Um, but I, if you say that in a compassionate way and you say, look, I know that's not who you are. I know it's not who you want to be, but it is, it is something that you did right? That's the difference between shame and guilt, right? Like shame is, is like, I am a horrible person and I, you know, I can't ever be good for anyone, much less myself. And guilt is I did something that hurts someone, but I still have value. I know that I, I know I'm a good person, right? Um, for all of you Recovered Life Show listeners who've battled in sobriety and are ready to level up, Listen up. I'm offering a week of my accountability coaching absolutely free. This isn't just about day-to-day -day survival. It's about aggressively propelling your life forward. Whether you're new to sobriety or have been sober for years and are struggling to elevate your life, I'm going to be your partner for a week and help you get on track and start living the recovered life you deserve. We're not just talking about setting goals here. We're going to pursue real, tangible breakthroughs in your personal and business life. This is more than recovery. It's about owning your path and seizing the greatness you're destined for. But hurry, spaces are limited. Don't wait. Go to DamonFrank.com and claim your free week and start your journey. It's time to transform survival into thriving. Visit DamonFrank.com and book your free week now. And we really, a lot of us fall into those traps. It's difficult. You know, I think it's, I, I, I think it's a balance. You know, I, I know that some of the biggest aha moments that I've had in my recovery and in my life were people who really, that I really trusted that I had mm -hmm. grown trust with that that that's what I, that I had actually asked for an honest opinion and they gave me an honest answer, but yeah. love me anyway. You know, I, yes. I I remember there's a guy who listens to the show, Kevin, who was my first sponsor. You know, and you know he he you know and I I'd asked him a question. Hey man, how come everything's blowing up? This is very early sobriety. How come everything's blowing up around me? Like everything, like jobs, like housing, every, it's just like everything was blowing up. Right. And, and, and he told me, he says, it's, it's because it's all about you. Like you, you have to stop mm. making your life all about you. That like killed because I didn't view myself as somebody who made my life all about like, but he was right. Right. You know, and the thing is, it is like, you know, if you want to have more friends and you want to be likable, then you need to be likable. Right. And yeah. he's like, I know you want to, and I know you can, and I know you are, but you're not, you know? And it was, it was great because I realized it was like, you know what? Yeah. Like it's not about me, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's what's caused, that's what's hurting me. Same thing with asking for help. It's really, it is about me, but it's not about me. Like I have got to, like, I've got to, I have to be that person if I'm going to become that person day to day. Absolutely. And when it comes to that, I always wonder like, what's again, what's underneath that, right? If you're, if you're not 
a likable person, what's going on? You know, if you're not behaving as a likable person, because it's really easy to tell most people are likable when they're being authentic. Most of the time, my experience with, with people that I interact with is if they're not being authentic, it feels off. I feel, I get this gut feeling that I need to be a little bit guarded with that person. And so I'm not going to ask them for help because I don't, in in my body, I don't feel like I can trust you, you know? And it's not that I think they're a bad person. I just don't think that they're capable of being fully authentic and maybe calling me on my stuff if it's needed, you know? But if somebody is, you know, is willing to, like you said, be compassionately uh, open with me and uh, maybe not trauma dump, because that's another, that that feels boundaryless, right? And that feels like, okay, now you're overwhelming me. Um, but, you know, being able to, to, to experience those is really important. And I think all of us, it's learning how to, uh, how to gauge that. I call it a radar, you know, like are, are people trustworthy or are they not? And, but also recognizing, like you said, the, the younger part of you, that third grader that's popping up, that isn't, that got really hurt and doesn't trust people. Give him a little bit of compassion. It once your body settles a little bit, now check and see how you feel about that person. Because when we are when we're when we're heightened or when we're feeling anxious or we're feeling uh, confronted in talking to someone, it's going to be hard for us to make a decision. So if we can just take a step back and and see, okay, how do I how do I feel? with this person now that I'm feeling a little more settled or grounded in my body. Um, that's one thing that I do with everyone now is we all need, especially men, we need to get into our bodies and we need to, instead of knowing how our bodies work for sport or for work, how do they work emotionally? Because most of us weren't trained to do that. This is the, okay. I, I love what you're saying here. And, and rarely do I hear actually therapists put it like that. And I, I think this is, I think this is such a key to what you said, because I feel that most of the recovery process, like, like I, 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 I always say like everybody's recovering from someone, the, these are human conditions. Right. Yes. And I think in people in recovery think, well, it's just me. It's just like, they have just a, it's a very small person, you know, view of, of the world. Everybody suffers with relationships, family. Everybody has issues with their career. Yeah. Everybody has setbacks, right? In, 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 in life. This is just the life condition. This is just the life that we all share. And I think this perspective of looking at it like that, and when you say kind of cutting yourself a break to that third that third grader, I yeah. found that this has been the big pivotal thing mm. because so much of, I think, the more you are, I'm not going to ask for help. I call it the John Wayne syndrome, right? Yeah. And I love John Wayne movies. I oh, do. Yeah. I, you, you got me, right? I, I love it because there's there's like a there, there's a, a rugged obstinance in it, right? Which I, I have to be honest, I feel compelled. I don't want to ask yeah. for help, right? Yeah. But this ability to kind of work this muscle and be vulnerable, right? Be able to reach out and to practice, hey, what would you do? And then be open really activates this bigger thing that's actually going on in my recovery, which is really kind of what we call emotional sobriety. It's awareness, mm -hmm. right? This, this awareness that everybody shares, right? That every, not just people in recovery, this awareness that's happening in my life. And, and the more and more I practice that, the more I really feel unauthentic being that third grader. Does, does mm. that make sense? Yes, absolutely. That So we call that reparenting. So once you feel inauthentic in that, that means that you that third grader is now feels okay settling down and doesn't need to come up as much. So you've kind of effectively, you know, if you want to use the term, kind of reparented that child by giving him some compassion and saying, "Hey, dude, sorry, you know, like I that you got hurt, uh, you know." 
I want you to learn how to trust that I have this as the adult in my adult body, right? And you don't have to be that specific and talking to yourself. And you can also say all that stuff in your head so that you don't feel weird, right? But it's just acknowledging, oh my gosh, that was that's an old thing that's been with me for a long time. And the the I here's the here's the kicker for me is that independent model that John Wayne or Clint Eastwood idea of roughing and toughing your way through it, that doesn't work. Because what it does is it brings up your defenses. Mm -hmm. Now I have to protect myself and now I'm protecting myself from me. And if, you know, if you've gotten that message, what we know is that when we feel seen and heard and like we are authentically cared for, we settle. Right. And then we can be, we can make logical decisions. Relationships are 100% emotional. There's no room for logic in relationships. So when we bring our logic in, we're actually kind of messing it up. And that's why it's so important that we need to get in touch with our emotions. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We have a guy, George Schneider, who comes on the show a lot. And he always asks the question, says who? You know, when I say, oh, I shouldn't be able to do it. Well, who says that? You know, when you yeah. really track that back, like what you're talking, would you would I really go back? I was like, you know, that person I wouldn't take advice from now. Knowing yeah. what I know, like they had some really great qualities. Sure. And these were great. And I think I could emulate those and those are great to model and those are great. But all this other stuff, that really just wasn't right. You know, it just wasn't right. At the time it looked right. Sure. But now it doesn't. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a really hard question, Kyle. Okay. As a therapist here, you you know, we're talking really about breakthroughs. We're, we're talking right now about breakthroughs, about yeah. having this, this moment. Oh, okay. I have to be open. I have to put myself out there. I'm sure you see people who are unable to do that. What is the, what is that? What is that thing? Is it pride at the end of the day? What, what is it? Um, You know, it's interesting. I was thinking about the pride and um, shame kept coming up for me. And they, they've, I'm always, when I, when I think about the concept of pride, I'm super curious, like, what is that? Why do you feel like you need to, uh, you know, to handle things all on your own? And, and, and it's oftentimes it is this idea that um, there's that, that shame involved is like, what do I have to offer anyone? Uh, other than what I know that I can do, which is I can try and help people or take care of them or whatever. And now it's got nothing to do with you. And so you start losing, uh, you're losing yourself in it. I don't Am I answering a question? I lost track. Absolutely. Of and you know, you, you said, I, you know, we were talking about just what is the, what's the reason why some people can't break through? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you're talking about shame, which I want to get back yeah. to if you want to jump in on that. Like shame and and trauma, like it's the idea that um, you know I I've worked with people that are, some people have just been um, inadvertently shamed because their parents didn't know any better and they were just trying to give them tough love, and then there's people who were physically or emotionally abused or sexually abused, and you start to you have this concept, this belief that you know I'm not good enough or I don't matter, and you carry that through your life. And, you know, how am I going to help you other than trying to fix you if I don't matter? Because the idea is if I don't matter, then if I can fix you, maybe I'll feel better about myself and maybe I will matter. Right. And so it's all an um, inauthentic attempt. It, they're inauthentic attempts to connect. And I, and I think they are authentic in, in the desire to connect but the the attempt that you're making, it's like this ulterior motive, or you believe that other people always have an ulterior motive. And in my experience, a lot of it comes from this hurt and you know, and shame and these kind of core negative beliefs that we have about ourselves that drive that those interactions. I I like how you put that and I, I, you know, I want to dive in a little bit with the shame because this is something that I have found in recovery. And, you know, I've done a lot of service work with especially men 
you know, especially mm -hmm. the late, you know, I came into recovery in my 20s. So I deal with a lot of, they just find me late 20s, early 30s in my accountability coaching practice and that kind of stuff. I, I deal with this. And I've seen something in myself that I came into recovery with that I see in other people. And this is shame. Okay. And and I think it's not caught. And, and the reason it's not caught is because a lot of the things, a lot of the people come in through 12-step groups and as amazing as they are, a lot of the a lot of the literature was written in the 30s mm. and in the 40s and these were post war people and during that time men did not talk about shame they talked about yeah. fear so there's a lot about fear but fear is not shame you know shame is what i you know is what i feel that you're thinking about me too right like yes. and they and and this is this is a big thing and i think a lot of people think well i'm just fearful of doing it but I think you tapped on it. It's shame. It's shame. And it's unplaced shame. It shouldn't be on us, right? Like, and I identified this early on that this feeling and somebody smart enough around me to say, well, that's a feeling of shame, but you have nothing to be shameful for. You didn't do anything. And I know that people who have been raised in alcoholic homes have what I just call imparted, implanted shame mm. that has nothing to do with them. They had no control over it typically. Right. About either what happened in their life or how they perceived it or whatever. Yeah. Primarily kid. I know we're gonna, you're, you're going to jump into the trauma word. Right. Like, but <laughs> the shame that covers around. And I feel that that is a big barrier because they deal with all the things that have to do with fear, but still really can't get there because it's not fear. It's shame. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, and, and nobody. I, well, I shouldn't say nobody. Most people don't want to admit that they feel shameful or that they're, you know, that they feel worthless, right? Like, I don't want to say that out loud. And so that is something that you cover up. And a lot of it is adaptive behaviors that you learn. Like, I learned to take care of other people because that way maybe I won't feel shameful. I won't feel less than. I won't feel worthless, if I can do that, right? And the problem is, is that it comes out, it, it, it ends up kind of that um, the cycle keeps going, that you end up feeling more shameful because you can't fix other people, right? And then you're like, well, I can't fix myself. It's that attempt to go outward and I'm going to fix, you know, work with other, work on other people because I don't want to look in the mirror and actually do the work with myself, and I will, I'll be the first one to say that is a scary thing to do, you know, um, and it, 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 it comes from a lot of different interactions. I was the kid in my family that um, I had two really macho, you know, my dad loves John Wayne. He's, uh, he, he, you know, he, but he would make fun of me when I would cry. Like he would be like, <laughs> you know, like, like actually mocking me as an eight year old, just having an emotion, you know, and over time I learned that's not okay. But I was like, you know, screw that. I'm going to be me. And so I ended up being a little bit more aggressive towards people who treated me that way. Um, but then there, I was also intimidated by them. So if I'm existing in that dynamic, I'm being inauthentic, right? Yeah, and I think and that's why a lot of times people can't connect because people sense that you're not authentic, right? right? They sense yeah. it. Like there, there's a verbal cue almost. I don't even know what you would call that, but there is a, there's a feeling. It's like something's not quite right here. Yes. And so the reason that the, the thing that I've seen that works is when you have a person in your life whether it be a sponsor, a guide, a coach, whoever it is that can see you for who you really are and accepts you for who you really are and will engage in the hard truths with you, but also show you love and compassion, right? Like um, it, I work with, I've worked with people who were in their early to mid twenties and it takes years just for them to trust me as a therapist, because you can always say, well, I pay you, right? So, you know, that's always an out. Um, but over time, if they don't have anyone else in their life, that therapist can be, or the coach or the whoever it is, becomes that person for them. What that does is it tells them, oh my gosh, 
I finally trust you. This exists. I don't have to not trust everyone else. You know? Beautiful advice. And, you know, final thoughts here, Kyle. Mm. I'm sure there's somebody that's listening to this and they're just absolutely stuck. And and I know I've been there in my life. Yeah. Just stuck. And they they have a deep, maybe sinking feeling that the only way that they're going to get out of it, maybe they've listened to the podcast too, the only way they're really going to get out of it is if they start to build the community and they start to ask for help. Yeah. But they just, for whatever reason, are just on the fence. What advice would you give to them? I would say, first, uh, be compassionate if you can. Like, as much as you can, just give yourself a break. These behaviors of kind of isolating yourself or self-medicating or whatever it is, those are defense mechanisms. Those are ways to try and feel okay, right? And if we think about it as an adaptive behavior, we don't want to judge it. It is, it is what it is. And you know what? At one point, it worked for you. And so we want to just be aware that this is something that it may have worked for you. Obviously, if you feel like you're at a turning point in your life, it's not working anymore. So just acknowledge to yourself that what I've been doing isn't helping. And then if you go out, let's say you go to a 12-step program and you're sitting there, engage in it whatever way feels safe and okay to you. And give yourself the time and the space to kind of wade into it slowly and, you know, see if there is, ooh, that person seems like I really kind of resonate with them. If you're, you know, once you feel comfortable, reach out to that person and see if they are a safe person for you. And you have to take it slowly and practice connecting, practice and find people who are okay to do that with. Not everybody's your people. That is one of the things that I tell people all the time. And sometimes it's your family. Sometimes your family aren't your people. And we need to figure out how to how to work with that, how to maintain the family system, but also knowing I need to go elsewhere to get the the compassion and the the connection because there are some people that aren't capable of it for me. Kyle, great advice. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. We're going to put information about how you can get a hold of Kyle Miller uh, in the show notes and all of the information there uh, so you can connect with him if you would like to do so. Kyle, thanks so much for coming on the show. This has been super enlightening. Thank you for yeah. sharing your wisdom with us today. Absolutely. Thanks, Damon, for having me on. I love these kinds of conversations. So I had a lot of fun. Thanks. Sometimes addiction recovery can be a lonely battle, but you don't have to fight it alone. At Recovered Life, we're dedicated to helping you live your best recovered life. And that's why we're inviting you to subscribe to our free weekly newsletter. Every week, we carefully curate exclusive content from leading minds in addiction recovery, mental health, and all things important to the recovery lifestyle. Stay in the know with the latest news about addiction and get exclusive invitations to special recovery-focused events and explore insights tailored to support recovery from alcoholism, drug addiction, codependency, disordered eating, dysfunctional family dynamics, gambling, and so much more. With our newsletter, each week becomes an opportunity for growth, healing, and taking a step closer to the life you deserve. Take your first step towards a brighter future today. Go to recoveredlife.us and subscribe for free. Sign up now at recoveredlife.us.